is our lecture 14. It's our real analysis class. Thousand twenty, twenty one, and this is lecture fourteen. We are almost there. We have just today and one more lecture. So lecture thirteen, which was last Tuesday, we had some technical problems and it was not recorded. Maybe sometime in the future, next year, we will record lecture thirteen again. But let's see. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about differentiability of functions. That's the theme today. A brief recap of what we did in the last class, which was very interesting. So we were investigating our, you know, <coughs> model theorem, our main theorem that we wanted to investigate was the so-called fundamental theorem of calculus, which is one of the most outstanding achievements of mathematics. Uh, and in essence, it says that integration and differentiation are opposite operations, differentiation. So if you take the integral of the derivative, you get back to the function. If you take the derivative of the integral, you get back to the function, right? So I started telling you, if you get a function f, they continues in the interval a, b, and you define the function big F of x to be the integral from a to x of little f, what you get is that then big F is differentiable and big F prime of x is little f prime. Derivative of the integral is the function. But you also have that the integral a to b of this little function f of y dy, which is the integral from a to b of f prime y dy, is just f of b minus f of a. Okay, so these are, this is what I'm saying, you know. The derivative of the integral is the function, but also the integral of the derivative is the function <coughs> in some sense, right? So we want to understand what happens if we consider these problems under less regularity assumptions on our functions, okay? So here I assume that my little f was a continuous function on an interval a, b, okay? I want to understand what happens when I take just, say, integrable functions. Okay? An integrable function may be very different from a continuous function. You have done in an exercise in your homework an example of an integrable function which is unbounded in any interval that you come up with. So, but the point of the last lecture was to define the so-called Hardy Littlewood maximal operator. Okay. We define this, you know, you give me a function f, say uh, locally integrable. I say locally integrable, I mean that I, this function is in L1 of any ball locally integrable in Rd, and you can define the maximal function of f at the point x as taking what? Averages of the modulus of f of y dy, 
over balls, B, divide by the measure of the ball, and you take the supremum of these averages over all balls B that contain your point X. Okay? So the balls here, if you give me a point X, the balls don't have to be centered at X, it, they just have to contain my point X. And you're allowed to take an average over any ball that contain X, small ball or big ball, and the supremum of these averages, you just baptize as being your maximum function. Okay? So sometimes this is referred to as the uncentered hardy little wood maximal function. There are, there is the centered one in which you would take balls that are centered in X. So you would take a sub-collection of these balls, just the balls that are centered in X. Well, professor, what if I don't like balls? What if I like cubes better? That's fine. You can construct your maximal function taking cubes that are centered in X or that contain X. You could even take, uh, you know, whatever geometric shape you like better, as long as it's not too degenerate. So you can take geometric shapes, say, with a certain bounded eccentricity. Let's say shapes that you can put a ball inside and a ball outside. So you can take ellipsoids. You cannot take these things with the whole family of rectangles, because then rectangles could be very thin in one direction. But if you take cubes or you take ellipsoids with a bounded eccentricity, then you're fine. <coughs> so what we proved you know, in the last class was this uh, so-called Lebesgue differentiation. Theorem. This is one of my favorite theorems in the real analysis course. Maybe my favorite. Uh, which says that if I give you a function which is locally integrable in Rd, then the limit, okay, as the balls, as the measure of the balls go to zero, okay, of these averages, Remember, the point X is inside the ball. So you take balls that contain the point X, but that shrink to zero. The limit of these averages go back to the value f of X for almost every X in RD. Okay. So you really get that the averages around the point X you know, go back to the value of the function. Now, just almost everywhere, because your function is just even defined almost everywhere. So this is actually the best that you could hope for. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so this, this could be seen as the analog of the fundamental theorem of calculus, you know, for, for integrable functions, you know, because a derivative, derivative is just, if you, if you write down the expression of the derivative, you're just taking an average, you know, here from the interval A, to the interval a plus h, and then you divide by h, you know. So this is, in some sense, saying that the derivative of the integral goes back to the original function. <coughs> uh, the proof of this result, and now you're free to use this as, as much as you want, okay. The proof of this result was based in two main pillars, okay. So the first thing was this, uh, L one week estimate for the hardy little wood maximal operator that we proved. Okay? So we show this this object here is supposed to be bigger than the original function because this thing here from Lebesgue differentiation, this goes back to to F when the balls are small. But when the balls are big, you could do better. So in principle this is bigger or equal than the function. But it's not so much bigger. So we proved that uh, an estimate of this sort, the set where m of f is bigger than alpha, the measure of this set is less than or equal than the universal constant times the L1 norm of f over alpha. Right? So this is to say that 
MF belongs to L1 weak. And we have seen that this MF does not belong to L1. Second main ingredient that we proved, well, actually to prove this thing, we needed this Vitali covering lemma. <coughs> Vitali was a, an Italian mathematician, Giuseppe Vitali, who lived in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, and it's very interesting to see how some very deep results in analysis come from insights, from, from nice geometric insights. And this is one very seemingly very basic one, but it's very powerful. This is essentially to say that if you give me any collection B of balls, one, a finite collection of balls in your space, might have lots of overlap. of all different sizes, you can always find a disjoint subcollection of those balls that cover a universal portion of the volume. Okay? So given any collection of balls, there exists a subcollection, a, a disjoint subcollection. Let's call it bi1, bik, such that you know the sums of the measure of these bik's is at least a universal constant times the measure of the union of all these bl's uh, in the original set. Okay, f bij j from one to k. So you have a disjoint subcollections of of, of balls that covers a universal portion of the whole volume. And this holds for any collection of balls that you give me in the Euclidean space. So here you are in RD, and you get this with a constant which is very, very small. You can actually prove this with a constant 3 to the minus d. Well, this, this was what our proof gave us. So we proved with the constant 3 to the minus d, which is very, very small, but we don't care. As long as this, it is universal. Okay? It doesn't depend on the collection of balls that you gave me a priori. So if you put together these two results in a nice way, you go and you're able to prove the Lebesgue differentiation theorem. So this is a classical example in analysis of a, <coughs> of a pointwise convergence result. You know, you want to prove somehow that some objects pointwise converge pointwise to the value of your original function. What you do is you need you go to the maximal operator associated to it. Okay, so instead of considering just the situation where the balls, the radius of the ball shrinks to zero, I will consider actually all balls and I will take the worst case scenario. So this is the maximal function. And you really need to some sort of estimate on how big your maximal function is. And we have seen that the trick to do this was to consider an approximation of f by a good function. A good in this sense here was a function that does this job. So this would have to hold for a dense class of functions. In this case, if you take just continuous functions, it holds trivially, right? So you can approximate f in the L1 norm by a continuous function, and then you do the splitting in three argument, the usual, you split in three parts, and you use these ingredients here. <laughs> okay, so take a look at this proof, it's very beautiful. In fact, uh, in fact, we proved that we proved a little something a little bit stronger than this. We proved that, let's see, the lean soup, when the measure of the ball goes to zero, 
infinite axis in the ball of the averages. with the absolute value here, this goes to zero for almost every x. <sighs> be one. Okay. Of course this is stronger this is a stronger statement than this because this doesn't have if you just move the f of x here, you don't have the absolute value. If you move the absolute value inside this would get a, would give you a stronger statement. Uh, so, so a little note: the set of points where this holds is called the Lebesgue set. Okay. So the Lebesgue set is the points essentially where the Lebesgue differentiation theorem holds. So we proved that almost every point is in the Lebesgue set. In other words, the Lebesgue set is a set of full measure. Okay. Uh, <coughs> okay. The point of the class today is to go and discuss a little bit more the concept of I want to get a little bit back from the L1 and go back to discuss differentiability in the classical sense. So today I want to talk to you about functions of bounded variation and absolutely continuous functions on the real line. Okay, so the class today is all in one dimension. Let's do that. I want to show to you that in one dimension, the right setup for the fundamental theorem of calculus is when you assume that your function big F is absolutely continuous. Let's see. Okay. Point two of the class today. Functions of bounded variation. So the setup here would be function, let's say f, and I'm going to take a close at the interval a, b, a, B are not infinity, so I'm taking finite closed intervals to facilitate the discussion today. Many of the ideas that I will tell you today here, you can just, if, if you want to consider the, the functions defined on the whole real line, you can extend uh, and it goes through smoothly, okay? But let's just uh, work with the function uh, from a finite interval, A to B, taking real values, okay? So this function here, said to be of bounded variation or said to have bounded variation well let me call it big F let's call our function big F said to have bounded variation if this object, variation, let's just call variation of the function f in the interval a, b, let's denote it like this, defined as the supremum for all partitions p, sum of f of minus f of pj minus 1, j, say from 1 to n, this is finite. Okay, where this supremum is taken over all 
partitions. Partitions P. P is a partition of the interval. So A is your T uh, zero in this notation. Less than T one, less than T two, less than blah, 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 less than T N, and this is B. <coughs> okay? So what you do is you just take your interval A, B, you have here your function, you go and you partitionate the interval into some points, you just take the jumps, the sums of the jumps uh, in that partition, okay? And you take the supremum over all finite partitions. This supremum is called the total variation of your function f in the interval. When this supremum here, when this total variation is a finite number, we say that that function is a function of bounded variation. So if you think about this definition for a minute, you will see that the, the variation or the total variation here is trying to measure the oscillation of the function, the variation of the function. It's not trying to measure how big it is, you know. So a function, a function like this, which is constant, has variation zero. When you take these differences, you, you have no jumps, okay? Even if the function is not zero itself. But if you get a function which does like this, function will have a lot of variation, will have a lot of jumps, okay? So if you think about a function like sine of uh, 1 over x, for example, this function sine of 1 over x uh, in the interval 0, 1, okay? So this function does not have, not have bounded variation. Just define it at zero. So if you define this function f of x, sine of one over x in the interval zero, one, defining f of zero to be zero or one, whatever, this function does not have bounded variation. Prove this. This is an exercise for you. So functions that have lots of oscillation will not have bounded variation. I'm not saying anywhere here that my function is continuous, okay? So my function may have discontinuities. That's not a problem. Okay. <coughs> what else? Well, let's see. Uh, it should be clear from the definition it should be, two things should be clear from the definition here of a, of a total variation of a function. First, if you take a partition that refines another partition in the sense that if you take a partition that uh, has all these point, all these nodes, Tn, and you add up more nodes to that partition, so you will increase your sum here just by triangle inequality, okay? So if a partition refines another partition, you get something better. Also, I mean, if you split your interval in two parts, so it's clear that the variation of a function f over an interval, say, a, b, is, of course, the variation of f over an interval a, c, plus the variation of f over the interval c, b. Okay, so you can split if c is any point in between A and B. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Okay. So for the class today, let me say that a function f is increasing function f defined in this interval a, b is going to be increasing today when f of x is less than or equal to f of y for x less than y. And whenever I want to emphasize, I will say that it's strictly increasing when I want to have strict inequality. So if f of x is less, strictly less than f of y, 
Okay. So when I say increasing today, it's the same thing as I was saying before, maybe non-decreasing. Okay. So let's let's agree on this today. Uh, now, <coughs> the first thing, the first obvious thing is that uh, that if if f from a b to r is increasing and bounded it's increasing and bounded then of course it has bounded variation okay so you have a function here from a to b which is increasing bounded that the value at, at b is, is, is okay. so the variation of f in the interval a b here is of course f of b minus f of a so first the, the, the easiest functions of bounded variation that you can consider are the functions which are monotone increasing and bounded and in fact this, these are actually the building blocks. So the first proposition of the class today, proposition one, F A B to R uh, is of bounded variation. If and only if it can be written as a difference of two bounded and increasing functions. Okay. <coughs> the proof is very simple. Well, if your function f is the difference f1 minus f2, where f1 and f2 are bounded and increasing, of course, this implies that the variation of f is less than or equal than the variation of f1 plus the variation of f2. This is just by triangle inequality. Triangle inequality directly in the definition here. So if your f is f1 minus f2, you just split this in two parts, okay? So if these two functions are bounded and increasing, meaning they have bounded variation, this difference, of course, will have bounded variation. So this is one part, the converse. Now, this implication here. Now, start, starting with f, let's say, bv of the interval a, b, this is sometimes the notation, function of bounded variation in AB, uh, <coughs> what you can do is, you can consider the function, you can consider functions, the function that maps a point X into the variation of F over the interval AX, okay? So you have a function here in your interval AB, Okay. For any point x, you can consider the variation of the function up to that point x. Of course, this function that I just wrote here is an increasing function. If you go from x to y, of course, the variation from a to y is bigger than the variation from a to x. It's kind of written here. Of course, the variation is always something non-negative. Okay. So this is, by construction, an increasing function. Uh, and what you get here is you can write this function f of x as uh, using this function, variation of f from the interval a to x plus f of x to plus the variation of f over the interval a to x minus f of x minus this, actually. 
And you can easily verify that these are two increasing functions. Okay. The identity is obvious, right, because this function will cancel, and you have f of x over 2 plus f of x over 2. And I leave you as an exercise to prove that this is increasing, and this is also increasing. Simple exercise. Okay. <coughs> so now that we have agreed that the monotone increasing functions are the building blocks for the functions of bounded variation, we are going to focus a little bit in understanding the differentiability properties of the monotone increasing functions. This is the first theorem that I want to prove to you. Theorem one. Oh, we already have we already had proposition one, so let me call this theorem two. Let F from A B to R bounded and increasing. I emphasize that I'm not saying my function is continuous, okay? It's just a bounded and increasing function. It could have jumps. It's no problem. The claim is then f is differentiable almost everywhere. Okay, and this derivative uh, f is differentiable almost everywhere. Derivative is just defined almost everywhere. The derivative f prime is no negative. Almost everywhere, of course. Only when, it, only when it's defined. Uh, so let me, maybe we should say this. When defined, when defined, <coughs> f prime of x is bigger or equal than zero, and we also have the integral from a to b of f prime of x dx. This is what you want to compare with the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's going to be bigger or equal than zero. This is a function defined almost everywhere. So it's going to be bigger or equal than zero. Uh, this is going to be less than or equal than f of b minus f of a, okay? Professor. I should perhaps say, give me just a minute, I should perhaps say that this function f prime is measurable and non-negative, let's say. f prime is uh, measurable, no negative, almost everywhere. And we also have this thing. Go ahead. Ask me a question. Professor, boundedness, how much important in CRM? Because monotone city in the segment implies boundedness. We require f is bounded function. <coughs> but I think it's not important. Well, OK, I'm just, uh, this is just uh, this is just a, a reinforcement. That's, you're right. Okay, so if the function is increasing and f of b is, is a real number, then of course it's going yes, to be bounded. I agree. Upper bound, upper bound. That's, that's okay. This is okay. Okay? You don't have to write bounded if you don't want to. That's fine. <laughs> it's no big deal. So 
you can remove this if you want. Of course, it's going to be bounded. If it's defined from A, B to R, and it's increasing, this is going to be bounded. <coughs> okay. So this is our goal today. The first goal is to have a function which does this. I have some jumps. I want to show that this function is differentiable almost everywhere. Okay? And that the fundamental theorem of calculus almost holds. Well, we have an inequality. We have a fundamental inequality of calculus in this regard. Okay. Uh, <coughs> I, I just uh, put it bounded here, Mirmushkin. If you want to extend this result for functions from minus infinity to infinity, you can, okay? From minus infinity to infinity, if you have a bounded function, then you could replace this with the limit at infinity and the limit at minus infinity. <coughs> uh, okay. Uh, so again, the proof of this result, which we are going to investigate the differentiability in the classical sense, is also based in this in, in, in geometric considerations, right? So we are going to do a second Vitali covering. Okay. Let me do this lemma. Let me first define, okay, so let me first define what a Vitali covering is. Okay, so let E contain in R a say measurable set. Uh, we say that uh, let's take a collection of balls, a collection of balls B. They have an <coughs> you have a collection of balls. It may be an uncountable collection of balls. It doesn't have to be finite, doesn't have to be countable. Uh, uh, any collection of balls B is said to be a Vitali covering of the set E if the following holds. Okay. Uh, <coughs> what I want is that for every for every x in your set E and delta bigger than zero, there exists a ball B contained in my belonging to my collection with uh, x in this ball and the measure of this ball less than delta. So these balls will all be either, okay, um, we can take open balls or closed balls. So let's agree that we are either going to take a collection of open balls or closed balls, closed but non-degenerate, okay? So with, with uh, non-empty interior. I don't want to take just a, a point for me is not a ball in this case, okay? So I really want to have either open balls or closed balls with non-empty interior. So taking just one point does not count, okay? So a collection of balls, either open or closed with non-empty interior, is going to be a Vitali covering of a set E if Essentially, every point in E is covered by a ball of arbitrarily small size of your choice. So if you give me a point and a delta, there is a ball in the collection that covers the point, and the ball has measured less than delta. Okay? So you can imagine set E, and lots of balls here, for every point and every delta, there will be a ball in your collection, very small, that covers that point. We will see how this, how this thing here is going to help us. 
Well, we actually want to show this, this lemma. This is another Vitalik covering lemma. Let's, let me put here the second version. First version was the one that we used in the last class <coughs> about having a disjoint subcollection of balls that cover a universal portion. This one, I want to say the following. Okay, so let E be contained in R be a measurable set. I don't, I don't even need R. I can actually put RD. So let's, let's put RD. E contained in RD be a measurable set with finite measure, okay? So let me put a set with finite measure. And let B be a Vitali covering of E. Get me a Vitali covering of E. The claim is then there exists A disjoint. Subcollection, finite, this disjoint and finite subcollection. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Give me delta bigger than zero. Given delta bigger than zero, the claim is given delta bigger than zero, there exists a disjoint finite subcollection. Let's call it B1, B2, Bn, such that first sums of the measures of these Bi's here from 1 to n loses to the measure of the whole set plus delta and wins against the measure of the whole set minus epsilon, minus delta, and also the measure of I set intersection, the union of these balls is bigger or equal than this. Okay, so I want to prove, convince you that these two things hold. <coughs> if you start to think about this for five to ten minutes, you will convince yourself that this is reasonable. It's plausible. What you want to do is, in some sense, you're given your set E, and you know that every point in E is covered by a ball which has arbitrary, arbitrary size, you know? And you want to essentially construct a finite subcollection of balls that essentially cover everything. You know, given a delta, this, 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 the volume of the subcollection is essentially the measure of E, let's say plus or minus delta, because remember, if a point is close to the border of E or in the border of E, E could be a closed set. So any ball here will have a, par a portion outside. So really, this, this thing here, you, you cannot, it's not the case that all the balls are inside E. The definition just says that every point there is a ball that covers that point, but this ball doesn't have to be inside your set E, especially if the point is in the boundary. But you know, it's kind of intuitive in the sense that, all right, so if I want to find a disjoint family of a disjoint subcollection of balls that essentially cover everything, what I have to do is just start to pick up my points and, and put balls very small. And uh, whenever I pick another point, I, I pick a ball very small that doesn't touch any of the other balls. And I keep doing this until I, I get there, you know? So intuitively, this should work. We just have to make this uh, mathematically precise. And this is essentially what the statement is. <coughs> uh, so, so let's call this one and two. So we have two, let's call this star and double star. 
So the first thing is that, okay, I'm giving you this delta. First, choose, uh, choose an open set O that contains E. So pick an open set O that contains E. <coughs> Actually, before I do this, I want to do some first some reductions. So the first reduction that I wanted to make is that, okay, let's see, first. First reduction that I wanted to make is that I'm going to consider the case of open balls, okay? So uh, in case we are working with closed balls. I told you that the <coughs> this Vitalik covering that I start with, I could even take open balls or closed balls with non-empty interior. But in case we are working with closed balls of non-empty interior, in case there are any of these, so what you do is that Let's just call a ball B. You just consider you know, for, for an epsilon very small, bigger than zero, uh, you consider the ball, say, B epsilon to be one plus epsilon times B, you know? Take this ball, you, you take your <coughs> a little bit of a dilation of your balls in the collection, but you consider this thing to be the open, you know, consider open ball, an open ball that contains ball in your collection, you can contain, you can consider a little open ball here dilated by one over epsilon. And then you get a new collection, you fix an epsilon, you get a new collection now of open balls that is still a Vitali covering. And then you prove the result for this collection. And then you send epsilon to zero to you obtain the result for your old collection. Okay? So you prove for this and then and send your epsilon to zero. Okay. So this is just to convince you that, well, think about it, but this suffices to prove uh, in the case when all of our balls are open. Okay. Suffices to prove in the case of all of our balls are open balls. <coughs> The second observation is that, okay, so let me start. Given this delta, choose uh, an open set O that contains your set E, such that the Lebesgue measure of O minus E is less than delta. Okay? So we can always do this. This is the definition of the Lebesgue measure. Once you do this, we can consider, can consider <coughs> only the balls in my Vitalik covering in B that are entirely contained in this open set O. Okay, so if I get a very big ball, I take my set E, I cover it from set O, and I just consider the balls in my covering that are entirely contained in this open set O. Okay, I can always do this because for every point inside O, for every point inside E, it will be inside O, O is open, there will be a ball around it, this point. So I just disregard the, 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 the balls that may have radius too big. At every point, I, I can get my balls in the covering very, very small. Okay, so if you do this, if you just disregard the rest of the balls and just consider the balls that are inside your, your, your open set O, you automatically get this right-hand side here, the sums of the measures of the disjoint balls that you will choose at the end, but you have already disregarded the ones that are bad. So all of these will be inside your set O, so this whole union will be inside O, 
and the measure of O loses to the measure of E plus delta, by definition, right? The measure of O loses to the measure of E plus delta, okay? So this implies that you get, you get the right hand, uh, the left hand side of star for free. <coughs> you also get that star implies this double star. also get that star implies this double star. Why is that? Well, suppose you have proved this star. Suppose you have found a collection that verifies this, and you want to show that it verifies this thing. Well, let's see. <coughs> uh, you have your set E here. Then your, your union of balls take over something here, maybe a, let's call it x, this union of balls, bi, from 1 to n. So you have e, you have x, everything is inside O. And you want to analyze the measure of E intersection x, which is this set here. Measure of intersection x. <coughs> How do you do that? Well, <coughs> it's going to be, this is going to be uh, there is the part of x that is inside E, and there is the part of x that is outside, outside E, but this will still be inside O. Okay, so maybe you can write your x as the union of x intersection E, okay, uh, x intersection E, union x intersection, uh, maybe write this, uh, x minus E. Part inside E and the part outside E, okay? But the part outside E is contained, so this is x intersection E, this is contained in O minus E. Because x is inside O, so x minus E is contained in O minus E. So then you have x contained in these things, and then you can do, so measure of x is gonna lose to the measure of x intersection E plus measure of O minus E. Move this to this side. So of course this is less than or equal to the measure of x minus plus delta, this is less than delta, and this by part star is going to be bigger than measure of E minus delta. Okay, so when you move this delta to the left, you get measure of E minus two delta, less than or equal to measure of X intersection E. <coughs> okay, so this is how <coughs> part one implies part two. This star implies double star. So what you really need to prove is just this inequality here. What we have to prove. Okay. <coughs> Let's see. No, of course. Of course, okay, so it suffices, suffices to consider the case delta less than measure of E, right? Because if delta is not less than the measure of E, then there's nothing to do. <coughs> so what you do here is Let's do, let's do, let's think about how should I do this. Uh, 
let me think about it. Okay. Okay, so let me do this. So first, choose, so assume that the, the measure of E is bigger than delta. So you can choose a compact one contained in E with this measure of E1 bigger than delta. You can do this because you know that the measure of E is the supremum of the measure of the compacts inside it. So if the measure of E is bigger than delta, you can choose a compact such the measure is bigger or equal than delta, let's say. Okay, good. So why, what you can do is, well, this is part three. What you can do now is you, you cover you cover E1 by, you cover the set E1 by a, by a finite number of balls. <coughs> you can do this because I'm assuming that all my balls are open. This covering of balls covers E, of course it covers E1. Since E1 is compact, you can extract a finite subcover. So you cover your E1 by a finite number of balls. Now, you use, so let's just call these balls, okay, so you get a finite number of balls there. Let's say E1 is covered in this, this union of this, some balls, Bi. Not call Bi, but let, let me call here Ci. Ci are the balls there. Now you use the original, the first version of Tally covering, the first version, to choose a finite disjoint collection. You call it B1, B2, up to Bn1, such that, you know, the sums of the measures of these guys, i, from 1 to n1, is bigger or equal than that universal constant, c, times the measure of the union of these balls, right? Of the balls that covered e, which is, of course, bigger or equal than c times the measure of this e1. Okay? Which is, of course, bigger or equal than c delta because the measure of E1 was bigger or equal than delta. The C, remember, the C was 3 to the minus D. <coughs> okay. So you have this. You have found a subcollection that is bigger or equal than D delta. You got already some balls. Okay. If, if this subcollection of this finite disjoint collection of balls that you chose, which is bigger than C times delta, is bigger or equal than this number, you're done. Okay? If not, you do it again. You, you repeat the process. So this is some interactive argument as before. So the point is, if your C times delta is bigger or equal than M of E minus delta, you're done. That's okay, check. If not, what we do is the following. We take, let, consider the set E. Okay, so this is your whole set E. Okay, you chose a compact. There was a compact here inside. There were some disjoint balls that covered a, a portion of it. Okay, so you take your set E, you subtract uh, maybe what you want to do, no, I don't want to do this. If, if in your first interaction, the sums of the volumes of these balls, bi, from 1 to n1, is bigger or equal than m of e minus uh, delta, then you're done. If not, 
That is because the sum of these balls, M1, is going to be less than or equal than M of E minus delta. Less than. And then if not, what you do is you, you take your original set E and you remove all of these balls, bi, the closure of these balls from 1 to n1. Consider this set. Consider this set and remove from, from the covering all the balls that touch any of the bi closed, okay? So I claim is that if you remove all the balls that touch any of these first n1 that you selected, the remaining balls still form a vitalic covering of this set. E minus this closed set here. Because if a set is in E and it's not in this closed set, then there is a little open ball around it that does not touch any of these guys by the Vitalik covering condition. Okay? And of course, the measure of this set here, the measure of E minus the union of these BIs, <coughs> uh, Uh, is, of course, I want to argue that this is bigger or equal than, than this is uh, bigger or equal than the measure of E minus the measure of this union of BIs, right? Because by triangle inequality, if I move this guy to the other side, measure of E will be less than or equal than the measure of E minus a set plus the measure of the set, but then the measure of this union of, it's not triangle inequality, it's just this, the subadditivity of the Lebesgue measure. Uh, and then this measure of this union loses to, bigger, loses to M of E minus delta, so this is bigger or equal than delta. And you are in the same situation that you were before, you know? You have a set which is bigger than delta, <coughs> This is actually strict here, so this is strict here, okay? So you have a set, a vitalic covering of the set with balls that are disjoint with the balls that you selected previously. This set has measured bigger than delta, and then you do it again. You choose a compact set E2 contained in this new set with the measure of this compact set E2 bigger or equal than delta, and you repeat the process, and repeat the process. Why does this have, does this have to finish? Because at every time that you start with a set, a measure bigger than delta, you produce the disjoint collections of balls whose volume is at least C times delta, okay? So if you repeat this process k times, either it will finish, or you, when you finish, you finish, of course. If you don't finish, you keep going. But if you, if you repeat k times, so after k interactions, you, have, you will have generated a collection of balls such that the union of all of these balls that you have generated, you know, at this step, you generated n1 balls, and then you generate n2 balls, and then you generate n3 balls. Uh, at every step, after k steps, you will have something, the volumes of these balls will be uh, bigger than k times c delta. And of course, k times c delta is going to be bigger than what you want it to be, which is this m of e minus delta, when k is large enough or k bigger or equal than uh, m of e minus delta over c delta. C is just a universal constant, OK? OK. So the process will finish, and you will be done. OK. This is how you prove 
discovering lemma. Now let's see. Um, with the help of this, let's prove the differentiability of my <coughs> a function almost everywhere. So let's go back now to the proof of the main theorem, you know, of theorem two. Remember, I wanted to show that a function f, I started with a function f, big F, right? From A, B to R, which was increasing. I wanted to show that it's differentiable almost everywhere. <coughs> what we will do is that for each point X in the interval A, B, in the open interval A, B, we define we define a so-called four Dini numbers. And this will be P1 of F at the point X will be the limb soup when H approaches zero from the right of F of X plus H minus F of X over H. P2 will be the limb inf when h approaches zero from the left of the same quantity, p3 will be, sorry, lim inf when h approaches zero from the right. This is, will be the lim soup when h now approaches zero from the left of the same quantity. And the final one will be the lim inf H approaches zero from the left of this. Okay. So I'm going to define these four numbers. Of course, what I want, so these two numbers, lim sup and the lim inf, when H approaches zero from the right, this is the lim inf, the lim sup and the lim inf, when H approaches zero from the left of the difference quotients. Uh, to show that the function is differentiable, I have to show that these four numbers are the same. Okay? If I come from the right or if I come from the left, the lim inf is equal to the lim sup, which is equal to the limit. So the function, if these four numbers are the same, well, the function is differentiable at the point x if and only if these four numbers are equal and finite. Okay, so this is what we have to show. Uh, okay. Let's see if I can do this. <clears throat> okay. So let me split this proof into two, three parts. Step one, I want to show that each of these numbers is finite almost everywhere. Okay? Let me show for one of them the reasoning for the others is analogous. Okay? So let us show that d1 of f, let's show that the set one of f of x. So all of these numbers, because my function is increasing, okay, because my function is increasing, all of these numbers are <coughs> non-negative, okay? All of these numbers are non-negative. If you're taking the difference coming from the right, this number is bigger or equal than this, okay? So this is a non-negative number. Lim sup of non-negative things is non-negative. Lim inf of non-negative things is non-negative. If you're coming from the left, this number is less than this, but you're dividing by a negative quantity, so this reverts. So all of these are non-negative, okay? So this, is, this thing here is finite almost everywhere. My claim. Let's prove this. In fact, what you do is, so let EK be the set of x in your interval a, b, such that d1 of x at x is bigger than k. <laughs> Let's try to analyze the measure of this guy. Uh, 
I, I leave to you as an exercise to show that these functions are measurable functions. So therefore, this is a measurable set. I want to understand what's the measure of it. Uh, so if a point belongs here for any point x, what you can know, what you know is that, OK, so if, if this d1 of f is bigger than k, then there is a, a sequence of h going to 0 such that these quotients here are bigger than k. So for each x in this set, e k, there, is a, there exists a sequence of h, h going to 0. Write it like this. This is a bad chart. Such that. Uh, f of uh, x plus h minus f of x over h is bigger than k. Okay? So in other words, I mean, you can actually cover. You think about this point x being covered by this interval, x, x plus h. So every point in the set can be covered by an interval, x to x plus h. This is... We are now in one dimension, so these are our balls. This is covered by these guys. So every point x is covered by intervals like this. And I can actually find an h very, very small, as small as I want. So this is a Vitali covering of the set Ek. Vitali covering. Set of these intervals, this, 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 this the, the covering x, x plus h, that verify this thing, OK? From the lemma, I do a delta bigger than 0. From the lemma, what I have is I can extract a subcover, so I can have a finite and this joint collection, let me call x1 x1 plus h1, x2, x2 plus h2, and then so on. I have a finite collection of intervals of this type such that such that, well, in each of these guys, you have f of xi plus hi minus f of xi over hi. It's bigger than k. But you also have that the sums of the measures of the intervals with just hi, some of the measures of the hi's are bigger or equal than the measure of the whole thing, the set EK minus a delta. This is what you have, right? So what the Vitalik covering lemma gives you. But now you're, you're, you're good to go because this first thing implies that f of xi plus hi minus f of xi is bigger than k delta. Uh, but then you can k h i. Then what you do is that you sum, implies that the sum of f of x i plus h i minus f of x i from i from 1 to n wins bigger than k times the sum of h i. The sum of h i is bigger than k times m of e k minus delta. But since the intervals are disjoint, since the intervals are disjoint here, and my function is increasing, whatever the sum is, it loses to f of b minus f of a. Okay? So if you work this out, you end up proving that the measure of e k minus delta loses to this number, f of b minus f of a over k. k is fixed. <coughs> Since delta was any number bigger than 0, this actually implies that the measure of ek has to lose to this number. 
So you, you gave me a bound on the measure of the set EK that goes to zero with this K. Okay. This you know that the set E, the points where D1 of F of X is infinity, has to be the intersection of all the EKs, K bigger than one. We already know that in this case, the measure of E is the limit of the measures of the EKs when K goes to infinity, and this goes to zero. Okay? <coughs> uh, okay. Okay. So therefore, you prove that Almost everywhere, this, this is a, these guys are finite. Okay, these guys are finite. Let me go to step two. Step two would be to prove that, to actually prove that these guys are equal. Okay, to actually try to prove that these guys are equal. Okay, any two of these. What I will do here, let's pick a pair. <coughs> Let me pick a pair of points and see what we can do it again. Ah, okay, so now I'm gonna need a bit of, now I'm gonna need a bit of, it's the same idea. Okay, so let me pick two of these guys. So let us prove that two of these guys are the same. Let me prove that D1 of F, X, uh, let me show that, uh, let us prove that the set where this is bigger than D4 has measure zero. Okay. Let me take two of these Dini numbers and prove that the set where this one is bigger than this one has measure zero. Uh, for this, it suffices to consider the sets, say, A, R, S, where R and S are rational numbers, set where D1 of F of X is bigger than R, bigger than S, bigger than this guy. If I prove that this sets and prove that measure of each of these guys zero. Okay. So if I prove that the set <coughs> of this form for A, R, and S, rational numbers, all of these are no negative. So it suffices to assume R bigger than S bigger than zero. If I can prove that a set of this form has measure zero, I will be proving when I take the intersections or the unions of all of these things over all R and S rational numbers, the union of all of these things is this set, the set where D1 is bigger than D4. So the unions of sets of measure zero will have measure zero. Okay, so let's, <coughs> let me fix a set of this form, A, and let me prove that this has measure zero. The idea is the same. But now we are going to have to use the other elements of the Vitali covering. So the idea is the same here. Uh, first, okay, so the idea is for each x in this A, uh, S before my f is less than s, what I guess is that I have a sequence of h arbitrarily small such that f of x minus h minus f of, f of x, I'm already changing h by minus h, less than s. 
Okay? This means that, again, every point x here is now covered by some intervals that go from x minus h to x. And then you have a Vitali covering of this set. So by the lemma, what you have is a this lemma, we have finite disjoint collection, call it xj minus hj up to xj, such that, so you get this, f of j minus xj, f of xj. <coughs> well, if I, if I already revert here, I will get f of xj minus f of xj minus hj bigger than sh, hj. You get this. <coughs> uh, yes. No, no, no. I just multiply, this fraction is the same, multiply by minus one. You get this is less than this. And such that the measure of A intersection, the union of these intervals, x minus j minus hj, j from one to n, was bigger or equal than m of A minus two delta. And the sum of these hj's here is bigger or equal than m of a minus delta. Okay, so you get these three, these two conditions here you get from the Vitali covering, right? That the sum of the measures of these disjoint intervals wins against the measure of a minus delta. A intersection, these guys, wins against measure of a minus two delta. And this is the condition defining the limit. Okay. Okay, so once you have this, the idea now is to get, <coughs> uh, so okay, so from this, from this, you get, if you, if you add these up, you add these up, you get that the sum from j1 to n of this f of xj minus f of xj minus hj, loses to S times the sum of HJs, okay. Sorry, this is, I want something that loses. I want the other inequality here. I want this now, S2. Measure of A plus delta. All right, one. Now, what you do is you work with the other inequalities. So we have worked with this part. Now I want to work with this part here, where d1 is bigger than r. Now, there's the set uh, b, which is going to be my original a, intersection, this union of these intervals, xj minus hj from 1 to n up to xj, but I'm going to put a little open here. So let me just consider these guys. Let me just consider essentially this set, but now with an open here on xj, because now I want my intervals to go to the right. So every x belonging to b, every x belonging to b is a point in a, and being a point in A is where the first Dini number is bigger than R, so there exists a sequence of H's such that X and X plus H is inside, you know, you have F of X plus H minus F of X over H bigger than R, and this X and X plus H is still inside these guys here inside this union. 
because I'm, I'm not taking this endpoint xj, which could be the point where you wouldn't have this. So I take h very small, such that I'm still inside this union here. Okay? And this is a Vitali covering of the set B. Every point here in B can be covered by a small interval, so every point maybe you should call every y in B, a, a little interval y, y plus h, such that f of y plus h minus f of y is bigger than r. So then you use the lemma, again, the lemma to get a subcover, let's call this y1, y1 plus h1, uh, Maybe H is what I chose before. So let's call Y, Y plus K. Y plus K. One, Y two, Y two plus K two, and so on. Such that, that the following happens. Well, that the following happens. And now you get for each of these guys f of uh, y i minus k i plus k i minus f of y i bigger than r k i. That's good. From construction, each of these guys, each of these intervals, yi to yi plus ki, is contained in sum of the xj minus hj, j, uh, for one of the j's. And you also have that the sum of these chi i's here, sum of these chi i's, is bigger or equal than the measure of b, the measure of this whole thing, minus delta. But the measure of b was bigger than the measure of a minus 2 delta. So this is bigger or equal than the measure of a minus 3 delta. So then you are able to conclude, because what you're going to do is you're going to sum this and this. So the sum of f of yi plus ki minus f of yi, i from 1 to whatever number you got here, n tilde, this definitely wins against r times the sum of ki's. Ki is bigger than this guy, so this wins against R times measure of A minus 3 delta. But you know, <coughs> these are all disjoint intervals, and each of these guys, each of these guys is contained in sum of the previous intervals xj minus hj. So the sum loses, you know, so you have here you can split, you know, you have a bunch of, you had your xj minus uh, hj before. One, here's another one. And then the new intervals that you, that you chose here will be some, somewhat contained here. Of course, when you sum the increments, your, your function is, non, is, is, is increasing. When you sum these increments, the increments of the pieces that lie inside this one interval is going to lose to the whole increment from this point to this point. So you kind of split the i's according to which this interval belongs to the interval xj minus hj up to xj. Then you get that the sum i from 1 to n tilde loses to the sum from j from 1 to n of the original intervals, you know, xj uh, minus xj minus hj. These are all finite sums, okay? So you may have two of these guys falling in the first interval, 10 falling in the second, and so on. 
And this, by construction, was less than this number, s that plus that. So here's your contradiction, right? So you found that r times the measure of a minus 3 delta, blah, 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 was less than s measure of a plus delta, OK? If the measure of the set a were bigger than 0, since this inequality holds for any delta, this would imply that at the limit, when you send delta for 0, r times the measure of a would have to be less than s times the measure of a. If the measure of a were less than 0, this would imply that r is less than or equal than s, okay? which is a contradiction because r is bigger than s. So this is a contradiction when you send your delta to 0. OK. So this is how you prove. You have to really use the two sides of your Vitali covering to prove this thing. So we actually prove with this step 2 that any two of these, well, we chose a pair of Dini numbers, but the argument for the other pairs is the same. Uh, we proved that the function is actually differentiable almost everywhere. So we prove that the set where this is, these are different has measure 0. OK. OK. Let's just conclude. Uh, OK. Um, Step three is the conclusion. No, okay, my chalk is bad. Step three is the conclusion, and it's the following. Uh, okay, so now we have seen that my function f is an increasing function from a to b is differentiable almost everywhere. That's fine. Now I want to show the final inequality. I want to kind of understand what happens. Well, then you consider, OK, we have seen that f is differentiable almost everywhere. So now let this function fk of x be defined as f of x plus 1 over k minus f of x over 1 over k. So it's, uh, it's like taking k here is a natural number. It's like taking my h before as 1 over k. So consider this function here fk. And here, of course, when you take f of x plus 1 over k, you might be passing your point b if you want to take fk of b. Well, what the hell is fk of b? So let's just let us agree that, uh, that uh, f of y is equal to f of b or y bigger or equal than b. OK, let's agree on this. So your function was increasing from a to b, and here, let's just put it flat. Now this function is well defined in the interval a, b. OK, so we have seen, have seen that this sequence fk converges to f prime almost everywhere. We have seen that this. For almost every point x, this limit exists when k goes to infinity. And this is the function that we are calling the derivative, f prime. Uh, and then, so this is just a matter of using Fatou's lemma. If I use Fatou's lemma, what I get is that this function is, uh, pa -pa -pa -pa, of course, uh, the limit integral of f prime of x dx from a to b is this is bigger or equal than 0. This is equal to, this is less than or equal than the limit when k goes to infinity of the integral of a to b of fk of x dx. Now let's just do a side calculation here. What is this integral from a to b of fk of x dx? Well, you just 
throw it in the formula. So this is the integral from a to b of f of x plus 1 over k minus f of x. Okay. 1 over k comes out. Okay. And here, if you do a little bit, a little change of variables, so this integral is going to be x plus 1 over k. If you call it y, this is going to be the integral from a plus 1 over k to b plus 1 over k of f of x dx. Okay. Now you see there is a huge cancellation going on here because one integral goes from a to b and the other integral goes from a plus 1 over k, which is very small, to b plus 1 over k. So all the piece in between cancels out, and you're just left with the limit as k goes to infinity of 1 over k times the integral. So the first integral is going to be just from a to a to the k, and the one from b to b plus 1 over k. So you you have a huge cancellation. This is going to be, perhaps I should write it here, it's going to be the limit. Damn it, this chalk is bad today. k goes to infinity off. The first part will be 1 over k integral from b, b plus 1 over k of f, minus uh, 1 over k integral from a a plus 1 over k of f. Now look what happens. This first integral from b to b plus 1 over k of the function f, the way that we agreed, everybody is equal to f of b. So this is f of b averaged over an interval. So the average is, of course, f of b. The second one is an average from a to a plus 1 over k of my function f. Since my function f is increasing, this average here beats f of a which is the smallest value. So therefore, when I'm subtracting, this is going to be less than or equal than f of b minus f of a. Okay. <coughs> I want to conclude the class today, since we're already past time. So this concludes the proof of the theorem, OK? This, is, this finishes the proof. So the proof had three steps. First one was to prove that all of those DD numbers were finite. Second step was to actually prove that any two of them were equal. And the third step is to use Fatou's lemma to conclude that you have this, this derivative, which is a non-negative function, since my function is increasing. Derivative is non-negative, but the integral loses to f of b minus f of a. It's just an inequality. In particular, this derivative is integrable, OK? This derivative is integrable. Uh, So every time that you have a, an increasing function on an interval, don't forget, increasing function on an interval, it ha is differentiable almost everywhere, and the derivative is integrable. And the integral of the derivative loses to f of b minus f of a. I want to make two remarks to finish. So corollary, corollary is that if f is a function from A to B, taking values on R, is of bounded variation. Then uh, F is differentiable almost everywhere. And the derivative belongs to L1 of the integral. <laughs> the derivative is integrable. Okay? So every function of bounded variation in an interval is differentiable almost everywhere. And this is simply because a function of bounded variation is the difference of two increasing functions. And increasing function is differentiable almost everywhere. So that's fine. So this follows directly from the previous result, including the fact that the derivative that the derivative is integrable.
Second observation is more of a remark. Uh, in general, you cannot say anything better than this inequality that you just proved. You cannot, you cannot say, May, Professor, we just proved that the integral of f prime was less than or equal than f of b minus f of a. But maybe, it, maybe it's equal, and we just don't know how to prove. So maybe the fundamental theorem of calculus holds here, and we just don't know how to prove. Well, this is not, this is not true. Okay? So you can really construct functions. So, so in general, you cannot say anything more than that. There are functions. So there are functions. And are counter staircase. Yes, there are functions that are increasing, but with f prime being zero almost everywhere. You can construct a function that is increasing, the derivative is zero almost everywhere. So a classical example. A classical example is the so-called Cantor-Lebesgue function. And I will conclude showing to you what this function is. <coughs> Control the back function is the following. We start with the counter set. Let me remind you the construction of the counter set. Uh, let's see. In the first step, we start with 0, 1, and we remove the middle third. Right? So 1 third, 2 thirds. Okay, so let me say. Uh, let me call at each step um, the, the things that I removed. Okay, that, so I'm first step, step one, you remove you remove these two intervals, right? So one third, two thirds. At the second step, you remove another open interval here. So this is 1 over 9, 2 over 9, 1 over 9, 2 over 9, and uh, 7 over 9, 8 over 9, and so on. So I'm going, let's construct a function based on each of these removals, you know. So we are going to construct a sequence of functions, sequence of functions. fk. So I'm going to tell you what f1 is. f1 is you start with the 0, 1, and you take the first interval in step 1 that you wanted to remove. So this is 1 third, 2 thirds. So all the steps, the, my sequence of functions will have f of 0 being 0 and f of 1 being 1. Okay? But then I take this first interval and I make it a half here. I make it a half in this guy, and I make it linear in the other guy. So this is f1. Now f2, you're going to do the same, 0, 1, 1, this is 0. You already put 1 third, 2 thirds here. This was a half. In these in this open intervals that you are removing from the counter set, once you define your function, it's never going to change anymore. So it's going to be a half here forever. So this is a half. But then in the other two intervals, you go, and this here is going to be 1 over 4, 1 half. And in the other one, it's going to be now 3 over 4. 
So what you are going to do is you are going to make your functions, your sequence of functions, flat at every interval that you remove from the counter set, from the zero one to make the counter set at every step. So in step one, you had one interval. You, you made it flat there. In step two, you had two intervals plus the interval before. So you're going to make it flat in these three intervals. And it's going to be according to the powers of two. So this is one over two. This is one over four, two over four, three over four. You have three intervals. You make it flat here, and you make it linear in the rest. Make it linear. You can write out, you can work out and write down the proper equation of the function if you want. <laughs> but that's it. At the next step, all of these flat pieces will be the same. You're going to choose a little piece here to make it flat. So the point is that you keep doing this. and you generate a sequence of functions, fk. So with this sequence of functions, from one step to another, what happens is that if you, have, if you happen to have a linear piece here, this is an interval that was untouched in the, in the function, what's going to happen is you're going to replace this linear piece by something which is in the middle third flat and a new linear piece. So you're going to replace by this thing. Okay, so this is what we did. The first thing here, we are, go we are going to replace by this. Second one, we are going to replace by this. For the next one, we would do the same. We take the, the first third and to replace. Third, replace. Third, replace. So you can show, you can show, for example, that this construction leads you to the following inequality. Fk plus 1 of x minus Fk of x, at any point, this loses to, let's say, 2 to the minus k. Okay? At every point, you know, from the step k to k plus 1, the difference of the function is kind of maximum distance that you have is at, at those points here. You can prove that this loses to 2 to the minus k. No. So in particular, fk, this counter, this, this sequence is uniformly convergent. This is a uniformly convergent sequence because this bound does not depend on the point x. Okay. So this is a uniformly convergent sequence, and the limit, so fk converges to a limit f, which is continuous. It's continuous. The uniform limit of a, con a sequence of continuous functions is continuous. Moreover, it's increasing. Each of these functions is increasing. f of 0 is 0. f of 1 is 1, and at the limit, you know, at every of the intervals of the counter set, the function that you constructed is flat. Flat here, flat here, flat here, flat here, flat here. Take the middle third, there's going to be lots of flat So f prime is flat at all the open intervals that you take out of the counter set. But in the original counter set, remember that the classical middle third counter set has Lebesgue measure zero. So all of these open intervals that you remove, they add up to measure one. And this is the catch, you know? In each of these intervals, your, your final function f is flat. Therefore, the derivative there, the classical derivative there, inside the open interval is actually zero. I mean, the function is differentiable because it's flat and the derivative is zero. So you have a function, and since the, these, these, uh, these open intervals add up to have measure one, the limiting function is a function that looks crazy like this. I mean, it's, just, it's going up, but uh, flat in all of the intervals that you remove from the counter set. Okay? Therefore, it has derivative zero almost everywhere. 
because these intervals have measure, add up to measure one. So this function has derivative zero almost everywhere. It's differentiable almost everywhere and has derivative zero almost everywhere, but it's not the zero function. It's actually a continuous function. Okay, so you found a continuous increasing function that has derivative almost everywhere and this derivative is zero. So this, this inequality here is actually strict because f of one is one and f of zero is zero in that case. You cannot do better than this. Well, I wish I could have done today the discussion about absolutely continuous functions, but we are going to do this in the next class. If you want to correct this inequality, and if you want to make it an equality, you know, you really have to ask a little bit more about the regularity of your function f. It doesn't have to be merely of bounded variation, because with bounded variation, you, we have seen that it doesn't work. You have to ask a little bit more. And this is the concept of a function being absolutely continuous. So we will see in the next class, of every function of, that is absolutely continuous is going to be of bounded variation. Therefore, we have already proved that the derivative exists almost everywhere. But the fundamental theorem of calculus will hold for absolutely continuous functions. Okay. So next class, we wrap up. We talk a little bit about absolutely continuous functions. And we might, if we have time, talk a little bit about convolutions and approximations of the identity. OK, so let's finish here today. Apologies for the delay. See you next Tuesday. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.